Washington, new at six, a bizarre new turn in the up in the air attorney general's race. We will show you why thousands of police will hit the streets to look for voters. And skiers are lamenting not just how green is their valley, but how green is their mountain. We'll show you if profits could still peak despite all the warm weather. And some generous GE workers bring good things to life for some youngsters who send their Santa letters to the main plant. And a developing storm will be meeting the colder air over the northeast tomorrow. That should lead to some frozen precipitation. Details all coming up next on Channel 6 News at 6. Now, the number one news station in the capital region. This is Channel 6 News at 6. Good evening, everyone. Thousands of New York City policemen are now going to be dispatched to help clear up this disputed New York State Attorney General's race. Dennis Vaco claims that thousands of votes for his opponent may be invalid, so the cops are on the case to seek those voters out. Albany News Chief Judy Sanders reports on the unusual new twist in court today. The final Board of Elections count gives Democrat Elliot Spitzer a 26,011 vote margin of victory. But Dennis Vaco's not giving up. His attorney argued in court today that up to 103,000 New York City votes could be invalid because they were cast by voters who'd either moved or are not U.S. citizens. We believe that we have found substantial number of irregularities which would either cause this election to be decided in favor of Dennis Vacco or to cause the doubt uh, as to the outcome of the election. Supreme Court Justice Thomas Keegan did not order a new election, but instead ordered that the questionable voters be sampled. And that means thousands of New York City police officers must go door to door to find out if voters live where they say they do and report back within a week. Spitzer's attorney claims these efforts are nothing more than an attempt to taint the election outcome. Senator, do you think Spitzer can hold on and become Attorney General January 1st? I think he's won this election. I think everybody, everybody who's ever looked at New York elections know Elliot Spitzer's won the election. It's over. Everybody but Dennis Vacco seems to know it's over. And the Board of Elections is ready to certify Spitzer the winner on the 15th. As far as the Board of Elections is concerned, yes. Um, any you know, further court action, I imagine, could, could stop it, but it would be unprecedented as far as I know. After a month of legal wrangling, people say, let's get it over with. Vacco doesn't want to give up. You think he should? Yes, I do. I wonder sometimes if it's Vaco, if it's the Republican Party doing it, because I think it's a done deal. Do you think they should just declare Spitzer the winner? It's going to wind up that way. <laughs> There's always a possibility that it could be election fraud, and I think if that's the case, they should uh, possibly have a recount or another election. Well, as it stands now, the State Board of Elections intends to certify Spitzer the winner on Tuesday, but attorneys predict that could change if evidence of widespread fraud is presented to the court on Monday. Liz? And little else is clear right now if in fact there is widespread fraud. Judy, is there? It isn't clear at all and these court challenges just go on and on and there's no certainty, Liz, that if they come in with a sampling and find out there's some fraud in the sampling that they won't then demand a full counting of every single one of the 103,000. So it could go on for quite a while and who's going to be Attorney General January 1st could then be thrown up in the air. Yes, I, I think right now that's a fair assessment. <laughs> yes. Judy, thanks. You're welcome. The shooting of a black woman by two white Rotterdam men is prompting yet another impassioned call for the passage of a hate crime bill. The public outcry over the issue became stronger today as more outraged voices called for change. It was last week when Sonia Thompson was shot in the neck by two white men as she walked in Arbor Hill. Police say the men were looking for someone black to shoot and they have labeled it a bias-related crime. Today, a coalition of groups pushing bias-related legislation in New York said it's time now for the governor to step in and urge Senate Republicans to pass a hate crimes bill. Well, when Matthew Shepard was beaten brutally by two young men and then tied to a fence in Wyoming, people in New York, we think, oh, we're civilized. That doesn't happen here. That happens out there in Wyoming. Well, we're here to say that these crimes happen daily in New York State. New York is one of only 10 states in the nation without a hate crimes bill. Senator Bruno has said the Senate has already passed legislation that addresses hate crimes. Sonia Thompson, incidentally, was released from the hospital this afternoon. And uh, some somber news to pass along to you tonight about baseball great Joe DiMaggio. His doctors say the Yankee Clipper has taken a serious turn for the worst. 
The Hall of Famer's been in a Hollywood, Florida hospital recovering from lung cancer surgery. Doctors say that over the weekend, DiMaggio developed an infection and fever, and his outlook has dimmed. DiMaggio turned 84 just last month. There are also some medical concerns tonight in the Siena camp. One of the Saints basketball standouts is dealing with a problem with his heart. Doug Sherman is live in the newsroom with more on this. Doug? Jack and Liz, Siena senior co-captain Melvin Freeney is uh, just gotten out of the hospital today and he's back on campus this evening on medication for pericarditis. On Friday, Freeney was taken out of Siena's game at Marist College when he wasn't feeling quite right. After experiencing more physical problems during practice on Sunday, Freeney was hospitalized. Doctors discovered he is suffering from an inflammation of the membrane covering the heart. It's a treatable viral form of pericarditis. So Freeney is off the court indefinitely. We were off Saturday, came back practice on Sunday afternoon, and again had similar type symptoms, lightheadedness, dizziness, and uh, we took him over to the hospital, they ran an EKG on him, and they found an abnormality on his EKG. Now, what we have to do now is just to find out what's causing that abnormality. Hewitt and the rest of the Siena basketball team are en route as we speak to Hamilton, where they will play tomorrow night. But uh, as we mentioned, Melvin Freeney is off the court indefinitely with the uh, form of pericarditis. The good news is, though, that apparently it is treatable, and uh, they're hoping that he will be able to get back onto the court before too terribly long. Jack, back to you. All right, fine. Thanks, Doug. A Castleton hunter with a happy trigger finger is busted for allegedly firing some shots at a deer decoy from his car. State environmental conservation officer set up a mechanical deer on Palmer Road in, in Skodak yesterday trying to crack down on illegal deer hunters, and it worked. Police say Alfred Maxwell of Miller Road drove by and fired off three rounds at the robo-deer from inside his car. We received complaints from private property owners uh, where they're having this type of problems and we'll bring the decoy in to address those problems uh, to get a few of the bad apples uh, that are out there that are doing the road hunting illegally. The conservation officers hide out near the robo deer waiting for a hunter to fire some shots and when they do they're caught on the spot. Miller pleaded his charge with several violations and is ordered to pay a $5,500 fine. Avid skiers long for the first weekend after Thanksgiving, traditionally the start of the winter season, but unusually warm weather, we we're all aware of that, has certainly melted their desire and the profits at local ski resorts. Mary Beth Winger tells us when peak profits may be ahead. The hills are alive, but not with the sound of shussing. Normally on December 7th, people would be tearing down the slopes, but because of this streak of unseasonably warm weather, business is going downhill. You'd think that would have people like Tyler Fairbank of Jiminy Peak taking a powder, but guess what? It hurts. Uh, you know, we'd much prefer to get off to a good start and get things rolling, but it, it, it doesn't kill us by any stretch of the imagination. Even though conditions aren't ideal, the folks at Jiminy aren't considering it a disaster just yet. In fact, if they get big snow by Christmas week, they could be riding high. Christmas week can, can make up uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 10 to 15 percent of our total business for the winter. With the cold front moving in, Fairbank and his staff are poised for action. If temperatures get down to 28 degrees, all 125 high-tech snow guns are aimed to generate an avalanche. In about 48 hours of snowmaking, we can get 25 percent of the mountain open. Give us a week of good snowmaking and look out. But when it's green in the lowlands, people don't get psyched for skiing. A reality check is as close as Jiminy's website. We tell people to go to our website to check out the mountain cam image of the day so that, hey, if they don't look out their window and see snow, they can go on the web and see, hey, it's at Jiminy. Fairbanks says Albany is the second biggest skiing city in the Northeast, right after Boston. Okay. So if normal winter comes as expected, there should be no shredding of profits. Mary Beth Winger, Channel 6 News, Hancock, Massachusetts. It's a pretty shot, wasn't it? Yeah. Forgot yeah. what it looked like. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Not unhappy. <laughs> and if is the big word right now. Just ahead on Channel 6 News, caught on tape, we will show you what an area store owner found out when he rolled on one of his clerks on the job. Hi, I'm Dandy DeColin. Coming up, you want a great book for the entire family. This is it. I'm going to tell you more about it. Stay around. Jack Arnicky, Liz Bishop, meteorologist Steve LaPointe, and Doug Sherman on sports. This is Channel 6 News at 6. 
The luck of a local convenience store cashier has run out. Authorities say she's been caught red-handed on tape stealing lottery tickets. The owner of Shortstops in New Scotland got suspicious when he noticed this discrepancy with some scratch-off lottery tickets, so he set up a surveillance camera. Authorities say he taped his clerk, 20-year-old Danielle Wright, stealing the tickets. Authorities say the Del Mar woman stole more than $4,000 worth of tickets. They don't know how much money she won. The state lottery division has charges if it chooses. A local girl parlays paper towels, plastic bags, and glass bottles into a contest-winning trip to Disney. That's in tonight's six hometowns. I'm so happy. <laughs> I can't believe that I won. <laughs> Amanda Wheelis of Schenectady High School won the drawing for the top state prize. It's a trip for four to Disney for winning the America Recycles Day contest. Amanda was among 75,000 students who took the pledge statewide to recycle more and to buy recycled products and packaging. Congratulations. A year before the millennium, retrospectives of our century have already begun. In Dina Cola's world, a perspective. Dan has a book which he says will delight the entire family. So here it is. No boring highfalutin essays, but a century's worth of events, anecdotes, and photos of important Americans. Some you've heard of, others the teachers never told you about. It's the American century, an informative, intelligent, and highly entertaining history of our century. No stodgy history book writing here. And the wonderful thing about it, you don't have to read it from front to back. Turn to any page, and I guarantee history has never been so much fun. Read this, and you'll be as smart as most history teachers. And given the fact that most high school history books are censored in order to appease people from different regions of the country, this is perfect, whether you're a kid or a Ph.D. Dark bits about presidents, gangsters, Capone, here he is at a baseball game. Immigration, union riots, race riots, wars, debacles like the Iran invasion in 1980. And a reminder of what it was like for kids really just a few years ago. The picture's going to be horrid or wonderful. Jimmy Stewart enlisting, Bogart and Bacall defying Congress. All you need to know about Jimmy Hoffa and Cesar Chavez, the American spies, the Rosenbergs, how Eisenhower did something highly improper to get them executed, Lindbergh duped by the Nazis. And here's a fine portrait of immigrant hunchback Charles Steinmetz of Schenectady, an electrical wizard who remained a gentle religious socialist. You want a book that you can peruse and study for days, for weeks, for years? The American Century. What a terrific gift. I'm Dan DiNicola. The American Century costs $50, but Dan tells us that many bookstores are discounting it for as much as 30%. It looks like good reading. Yeah, it, it would be interesting to go back. It would. All good things must come to an end. <laughs> Unfortunately, and meteorologist Steve LaPointe is just ahead to end ours. And now, your Storm Team 6 forecast with meteorologist Steve LaPointe. While temperatures have been dropping most of the day, currently 47 degrees, we'll slip back another few degrees through 8, 9 o'clock. Low 40s, cooler, but still not cold. Skies mostly cloudy, still a bit breezy out there, but the winds have been diminishing through the day and should continue to diminish through the night. 47 now at Albany with a dew point at 29. Northwesterly wind at 14. Pressure 30.07, and with the cold front well to our east, that barometer is rising. Colder weather lurks to the north and northwest. Uh, colder, but again, not cold. Given the time of the year, it's, uh, sometimes you get these warm spells that are followed by extremely cold spells, and it does not look like that's going to be the case, but still Burlington's down to 40, Watertown 37, Para 39's now out at Rochester and Buffalo with the 40s locally, and still some 50s in the Mid-Hudson Valley, New York, hanging on to a 61 degree reading, but again, the cooler air coming in on the west and northwesterly wind flow. We do have clouds off to the south, there's a little jet stream disturbance, which is producing this high cloud shield, and even some rain back in here, but this first batch of rain will be heading out just to our south overnight tonight. This front, though, is stalling, and an area of low pressure will form on it and ride right up the front tomorrow. So where we see the rain here tonight as that dissipates, we'll see a new batch flaring up by tomorrow morning and that will shoot up into at least central and southern New York, central and southern New England. And as that cooler air continues to filter in overnight tonight, should become just marginally cold enough. So we do see a bit of a mixed bag of precipitation developing as the low comes in. A mixture of rain and sleet. It'll be a real cold, raw day tomorrow. So that'll be the rude awakening with temperatures only in the middle and upper 30s. And even some wet snowflakes possible locally in a 
especially points north. There may be a fairly sharp northern cutoff to this, so the far north country may only escape with a little bit of light snow or a light mix with uh, most of it falling from about the capital region on southward. Now, the good news is this system should scoot out of here fairly rapidly. We'll start Wednesday with some clouds, but high pressure builds in from the west. The clouds go away, and we go over to mostly sunny skies, and temperatures actually fairly seasonable. Certainly a lot cooler than the warm spell we've had, but not cold. Temperatures in the low 40s Wednesday and likely again on Thursday. And the reason for that is the jet stream still a split flow. The exceptionally mild air running all the way up the Atlantic seaboard into New York and New England today with all kinds of record temperatures set and the northern branch of the jet stream locking that really cold air, the Arctic stuff, up in Canada, which sometimes this time of the year has a tendency to move southward, but not through at least Thursday and Friday with really a very moderate pattern setting up. The very warm air off to the south and the main stormy weather developing off to the south and west again should keep us, at least after tomorrow, fairly tranquil and fairly moderate. With all that in mind, my forecast for tonight goes this way. We're looking at temperatures dropping back to near 30 with a mostly cloudy sky, certainly much cooler than the past few nights, but again, not cold. Wind will diminish and shift into the north for tomorrow. Not a good day. It'll be cloudy and raw. Temperatures in the mid upper 30s. A cold rain will develop mixed with sleet and even some wet snowflakes at times. Northeasterly winds 5 to 15 miles an hour. That'll come to an end tomorrow night. Wednesday starts a little gray, but we'll go over to mostly sunny skies. Really a fine day for December. 42 degrees. And here's your extended forecast. Looking at low 40s Thursday, close to 40. There will be a cold front Thursday night, Friday morning with maybe a couple of snow showers. It doesn't really cool the temperatures much. We'll still hang near 40 degrees coming up on Saturday with overnight lows in the 20s. That is fairly typical weather. 476-WRGB is the weather phone number sponsored by Raymore and Flanagan. Forecasts also online at WRGB.com. So we bid a fond farewell we to one of the great farewell. weather adventures That's of right. recent Rec years. Record high today, by the way. I didn't mention it. 65 degrees, just to rub it in a little bit more. <laughs> we'll miss it. All right. Yes. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Up next, a look back at yesterday's NFL action and how some of the local teams are doing. But the big story really is coming from Siena College. Doug has the latest on the health of senior co-captain Melvin Freeney. He's along with Sports Next. And now, Sports with Doug Sherman. Welcome back, everybody. As we told you earlier in the newscast, Sienna's Melvin Freeney has been lost to the team indefinitely with a condition called pericarditis. The senior co-captain has been diagnosed with an irregular heartbeat and a slightly enlarged heart. The first sign of trouble came Friday night in Poughkeepsie when Freeney took himself out of Siena's game against Marist and then never returned. The initial diagnosis at the gymnasium Friday was dehydration, but then in practice Saturday he felt off again. Siena's medical staff then hospitalized the 22-year-old where doctors discovered pericarditis through an EKG. It's a major void for the Saints who lost for the first time on Friday night while their senior point guard was resting in the locker room. Freeney will miss tomorrow night's game at Colgate and remain out indefinitely. Uh, I think yesterday was a little bit down, but I think he's realizing that uh, as the tests come back and things are positive, I think his spirits are coming up a little bit. I've, he was more concerned about playing in the game Tuesday night, but, uh, you know, that's just a competitor. In. And we'll have an update tonight at 11. Now, to football, another questionable at best referee's call greatly impacted an NFL game yesterday, and this time it helped the Jets pull out a late victory. On fourth and goal from the five-yard line, Jets quarterback Vinny Testaverde was given credit for the game-winning touchdown with only 20 seconds left in the game, although multiple instant replays showed Testaverde was stopped short, meaning the Jets' 32-31 win should have been a 31-26 loss. All you guys are telling me that it looks like he didn't get in, so... But what difference does that make now? What do we want me to do, call them up and forfeit it? The Giants, meanwhile, didn't need the referee's help yesterday for their come-from-behind win at Arizona. The Giants were able to, uh, able to rally on the road to beat the Cardinals 23-19, even though Big Blue isn't likely to get itself back into the playoff hunt. New York did show it's still got some fight left in it. And the thing I, I guess I was most proud of with this group is that to go there against a team that was obviously fighting for a spot uh, continue for the playoff spot on the road, fall behind, and we showed a mental toughness about that and a composure that we, we continued to play. On to hockey, RPI's Elaine St. Hilaire has been named ECAC Player of the Week while leading the Engineers to a 2-0-1 record. The senior forward had two goals and four assists, helping Rensselaer improve to 6-4-1 overall. 
And finally, baseball news. The Arizona Diamondbacks have signed outfielder Steve Finley to a four-year contract. Finley helped to lead the Padres to the National League pennant this past season, but now he heads east to play in the desert and play for the Diamondbacks. But again, the late word on Melvin Freeney, the Siena point guard, is that he has a viral form of pericarditis, which is treatable. He's on medication ah. now, so the hope is that he will be back. They don't want to put a timetable on it because obviously his health is the most important thing. Yeah. But relatively good news late this afternoon on that. Yeah, that good. is a little bit better. Yes. He sort of makes their offense go, doesn't he? Senior co-captain who last year led the league in assists. Points aren't the big thing with Melvin, but he is the stabilizing influence offensively yeah. and defensively, so it's a major loss on the oh. court. That well, is. we wish him well. We hope he gets his health back. Absolutely. Right. Thanks, Doug. Okay. Time now to go to Brad Holbrook in the newsroom for a look at what's coming up tonight on Channel 6 News at 11. Thanks, Liz. Body piercing and tattoos. Got any, any in your house? Well, it is the way that a lot of young people are making statements these days. Now, a Rensselaer County legislator wants to stop kids from making such a lifelong decision at too early an age. We'll tell you about that. We'll also have the latest from outer space where astronauts are working on that new space station in orbit now. Join us for that and a whole lot more coming up tonight on Channel 6 News at 11. Thanks, Brad. When the GE main plant in Schenectady becomes the North Pole. We'll show you how up next. You can name the game. Check out Thursday's or Sunday's Times Union or visit our site at WRGB.com. This segment of Channel 6 News is sponsored by Toyota. Just 18 days till Christmas and kids are starting to get more and more excited about Santa's arrival. They want to be sure he knows what to bring when he slides down that chimney. So many are writing to Santa and hundreds of those letters arrive, believe it or not, at the Schenectady General Electric Company, where some company elves help Santa. Apparently when writing the letters, the kids ask for Santa's zip code and a parent will respond, oh, one, two, three, four, five. Well, that's the zip code at Schenectady GE. And those letters to Santa go to the corporate elves, members of the Elf Fund Society. We consider ourselves Santa's elves. Since he's so busy writing letters at the North Pole, this is our way to help him. Several members of the Elf Fund Society get together at lunch and at other times and go through the letters that come from coast to coast. They share the stories with each other. There are the ones you'd expect, lots of them. One now that's nine pages long, front and back of just just I want, I want. <laughs> but mixed in are also touching ones, like the one last year from a boy in Phoenix. He was writing from a car. Um, unfortunately, he didn't have a home. They were homeless. And uh, so he was just uh, asking uh, for his family to have a home because they were just living out of the car. Unfortunately, there was no return address, and we couldn't uh, respond to that at all. But sometimes the Elfin Society can respond, like to the boy who just lost his little brother in an accident. And he asked for little toys for his sisters and brothers and not much for himself. One of the committee members was familiar with having read the story that was her original hometown. She and her sister went out and, and purchased Christmas presents for the family. And already this year, the first touching letter, written in green, from a girl who wishes for joy for her family, good behavior for her in helping her mom with her little sister, and good grades. We can't give her good grades, but we can sure encourage her when we answer the letter that she's already a very valuable and kind person to be thinking of, of everybody else. Great way to spend a lunch hour, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Elfin Society, by the way, is a volunteer organization of GE employees and retirees, and the Schenectady chapter has about 3,000 members. That's it for us for tonight. CBS Evening News is next. Good night. Take care.